So in chapter 6, we'll continue to work with Newton's laws. We'll just do additional examples. In the first part, we discuss the concept of friction. Friction is a force that acts to resist motion. So if we have the ground and we have a block sitting on the ground, we could draw a free body diagram, identify all the forces. So I draw my little central dot there. I have my gravity that's pulling me down. That's the force of gravity. I have the normal force that acts perpendicular to whatever I'm resting on, whatever my surface is, that's going to be the normal force. And then as I slide this along the ground, I have my motion. There's something that resists this motion. There's a force here that counteracts however I push my block. This is called the force of friction. The force of friction, if we could zoom in here, if we could zoom in and blow up what that looks like. So let's take a close-up view. Very jagged surfaces, two very jagged surfaces rubbing up against each other. Even though they look smooth on a macroscopic, on a large level, they're very jagged. At the atomic level, these two guys, these two surfaces, are glued together. They're glued together with some kind of atomic glue. And this rubbing, the, this glue between the atoms, is what causes my force of friction. And when I'm talking about the force of friction, the magnitude of this friction depends on the surfaces that are rubbing against each other. It depends on surfaces. So, for example, something like sandpaper, rubbing on sandpaper, would have a very, very high force of friction. whereas two surfaces, something like ice, would have a very low force of friction. And I can quantify this with an equation, an equation that says that the force of friction is equal to the Greek letter mu, I'm going to attach a little k onto here, times n, times the normal force. So this is the way your book writes it. I would likely write it mu k times fn, so that I don't confuse the n with newtons. In this equation, mu k has a very specific definition. Mu k is equal to the coefficient of friction. And in the case of mu k, it's the coefficient of kinetic friction where kinetic is motion. So this is friction between moving objects. So the final subtle points to keep in mind for kinetic friction are that friction always opposes motion. So if I'm sliding my box to the right, my frictional force is always going to be opposing that motion force of friction opposes motion. Also we need to keep in mind that fric the friction law is only approximately correct. Once again, if we zoom in on this where the two surfaces are in contact and if we could blow this up, we would see that what actually happens here is we're making and breaking atomic connections. So atoms are actually sticking together between these two surfaces. And every time we move this block, every time it slides, we're breaking the connections that the atoms make between these two surfaces, and then they rebuild and then they break again. It's the amount of glue making and breaking of these atomic connections that leads to your force of friction. And we can't limit our discussion of friction to moving objects. We also have friction for non-moving objects. So I can have a person standing here, 
and a box that I'm trying to push. We've probably all experienced this. When you push a box, apply some force to push it, and it still doesn't move. It doesn't move because it has friction. That force of friction is equal to, we'll call it Fs max, where x stands for static, and that's going to be equal to mu s times the normal force, or the way I will write it, mu s times fn, also the normal force. So mu s is equal to the coefficient of friction, but in this case, that little s right there tells us it's for static friction. It's for the frictional force between two objects that are not moving. Coefficient of static friction. Static friction acts similarly to kinetic friction. It acts parallel and opposite to your applied force. So in this case up here, we have our push force acting towards the right, our frictional force, our friction force from static friction would be acting to the left. And as long as F push is less than the force of static friction, then the box won't move. And conceptually, this kind of makes sense. If you've ever thought about pushing a big heavy box, it's my person pushes on this box. He's trying to get it moving. It's very, very hard to make a heavy object move. Hard to get something moving. Hard to start the motion. But once you get this box sliding along the floor, it becomes a whole lot easier. We can see this in the coefficients of friction. Because in general, for any two surfaces, the coefficient of static friction between those surfaces is going to be greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. We have to overcome this larger static friction coefficient to get things moving. Once we do that, it becomes much easier because the coefficient of kinetic friction is much lower. And our final note on friction before we move on is to discuss air resistance. Usually we work in the ideal world, so we don't need to worry about this. But in case we ever do, the force of air resistance, the air resistance frictional force, it will oppose motion, so it will act opposite to the direction you're moving, and it's equal to 1 half times C times rho times A times V squared, where C is the air pressure you have acting on something due to an object's shape. A cone has much a much lower C, so it'll have much lower air pressure due to having a good shape that cuts through the air. This C parameter you can think of as being how aerodynamic your object is. Rho, this curly P, is the air density. That's how dense air is. That is 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. A is the cross-sectional area that's running into the wind, and V squared is how fast you're going. So to get some practice with all these concepts of friction, I suggest you try check up 6.1. And we'll move on to discussing Hooke's Law. So we can also discuss restoring forces that are described by Hooke's Law. 
Hooke's Law applies to elastic objects, objects that are stretchy, things like springs and rubber bands. Conceptually, when you pull a spring, it bounces back. And the force of this bounce back is directly proportional to the amount that you stretch something according to the following equation. F, the force of the bounce back, is equal to a negative k times x, where k is called a spring constant. And this describes how stretchy your spring is. x is how much you stretch your spring. In this case, x is going to be positive, or how much you compress your spring. So x would be negative. And then the negative sign tells us that we have a restoring force. It means that Hooke's law always acts to bounce back to resist the original motion, the change in the natural position of your spring. We can see this in a picture. Let's say that I have a spring, a natural spring, just sitting at its natural rest length. This is where the spring likes to be. I can take that spring and I can compress it. I can shrink it down a little bit. I can shrink it down so that it's slightly shorter than the original natural position of the spring. In this case, I have compressed my spring by compressing it I've changed its natural position the amount of this change is going to be negative x x is the change from its natural state and the negative tells me that I've compressed it alternatively with a spring I can stretch it so I can make it go past its natural length. I've now gone past the natural length. I've gone past the natural length by a distance x, and in this case is going to be positive. x is the amount of change. Positive tells me that I have actually stretched my spring. That really is Hooke's Law summarized. To practice with this, I'd suggest check up 6.2. And for a final application of Newton's laws, let's talk about circular forces. Let's say that we take a rock, tie a rope to it, and we swing it around in a circle. Okay, we can identify what forces are acting on the rock, and for now, if we ignore gravity, then the only real force we have acting is the force due to the tension in this string, and that force, that force of tension, acts along the direction of the string. So tension is our force that's acting, and it's acting towards the center of a circle. And since tension is acting towards the center of the circle, it's a very special kind of force in this case. It's what we would call a centripetal force. So we have a centripetal force, a force acting in a circle. How do Newton's laws play into understanding this? Well, let's look at Newton's laws. Particularly, we'll look at Newton's second law of motion. Newton's second law of motion tells us that force is equal to mass times acceleration. In this case, our force is tension. 
is equal to mass times acceleration, but it's not just any acceleration. The acceleration we have here is centripetal acceleration because we have it moving in a circle. If we remember back, centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So the tension, the circular force, the centripetal force, is m times v squared over r. So in this particular case, our circular force is mv squared over r. And this will work in any situation. We can generalize this. In this case, we had tension that's providing our circular force. It doesn't have to be tension. So we'll generalize this to be any force in a circle, calling it Fc, is equal to mass times velocity squared divided by r, centripetal force. And those are all the additional applications of Newton's laws. And last of all in this chapter, we want to get a big picture view of what forces actually are. Forces can be broken down into four main types. First one, force of gravity. This is the attractive force that exists between mass. Many of the forces we've discussed have been contact forces. These forces are electromagnetic in nature. The electromagnetic force exists because of the interaction of charged particles. Charges interact with each other, the little atomic glue that holds surfaces together, that creates friction, that prevents you from being able to push things. These are all electromagnetic in nature. The third force, something called the strong force. This force is kind of like a nuclear glue. It holds the nucleus together. Without the strong force, protons, which are like charges, would all repel each other. So the strong force is the nuclear glue that prevents this from happening. And finally, we have the weak force. And this force is one that's released in radioactive decay. So when you see superheroes being created on TV, there's probably some kind of weak force that's happening.